uh, lecture series. Just a few seconds. Uh, feel free to use the chat feature tonight uh, to ask questions, uh, say hi, all those good things. Uh, but as we go out the meeting, we'll talk about a couple other things uh, regarding raising your hand and, and the Q&A later too as well, once we get started. Good evening, brethren, and welcome to the Bicentennial Lecture Series the for the Grand Lodge of Missouri as we kick off celebrating uh, over 200 years of Freemasonry in Missouri and 200 years of the Grand Lodge uh, of Missouri. Um, with that being said, uh, we're happy to have you here joining us. And as part of that experience, we are going to have a Q&A tonight, some remarks uh, from our Grand Master, and an exciting presentation, which we hope you enjoy. This presentation is being recorded as well as streamed live on Facebook. So uh, keep that in mind as we go forward. At the end of the presentation, you will have the opportunity to ask questions. Uh, we encourage those, and hopefully we can have some good discussion from them. Uh, at that point, you can utilize the chat feature, as well as there's a section uh, for reactions where uh, you can raise your hand and things like that through the chat feature uh, to acknowledge uh, that you want to speak up. So a couple things about what we're doing tonight and what we'll be doing going forward uh, the Masonic Education Committee has been asked and will be facilitating a series of lectures going forward on the last Sunday uh, of every month. These lectures will begin at 7 p.m. And, and feature uh, brothers from around the state of Missouri as well as elsewhere, sharing their insights, research, uh, and thoughts about Freemasonry in Missouri, its history, uh, famous Missourians uh, who were Freemasons, uh, and the interactions uh, that occurred over our, our many years of history. Uh, if you're a Missouri Mason and you want to sign up to participate in these lectures, we encourage you to actively watch the Grand Lodge database and portal, your membership portal. Uh, under the seminar tab, you'll find announcements for these lectures popping up and you can sign up for them there. If you are not a member of the Grand Lodge of Missouri and you're interested in participating in these events, uh, we would encourage you to uh, watch 
the Grand Lodge's Facebook page and the events tab, where we'll have separate event pages for each lecture. Uh, and each one of those will sooner or later have a link to an Eventbrite page where you can sign up to participate. Uh, these lectures are mildly limited by attendance, depending on the outpouring of attendees, uh, whether we can fit everyone on this call or uh, your best route may be viewing it live in the live stream. If you're interested though, like we said, uh, the footage of all of these discussions will be available virtually afterwards. Uh, my name is Jacob Thompson. I probably should have started off with that good one. Uh, I am the chairman of the Masonic Education Committee for the Grand Lodge, Missouri, uh, and it's an honor and privilege for me to be a part of these lectures. At this time, though, I'd like, I have the distinct honor and pleasure uh, to hand it over to our Grand Master, the Grand Master of Masons of the State of Missouri, uh, Most Worshipful Brother, Barry V. Cundiff, for some opening remarks uh, and some of his insights as he is our special co-host for the evening. Most Worshipful Brother Cundiff, sir, the floor is yours. Thank you, Right Worshipful Brother Jacob. Uh, thank you and thank the members of your committee for the work that you're doing on this. I am really looking forward to this lecture series and I wanna welcome all those who are participating and watching to the Bicentennial Lecture Series. As Jacob has said, it's anticipated there will be one lecture per month over the, the next year or so. Uh, the first, as I understand it tonight, will concern Freemasonry in Missouri during the Civil War, which is a topic I've been interested in learning something more about for a long time. Uh, many other bicentennial events and programs will be coming up. Uh, just a few of the highlights, uh, we are in the process of putting out a Masonic Missouri historical tour book that you will be able to use to visit sites in the state of Missouri with Masonic history. Uh, it will be in the form of a, a booklet that you can fill in where you've gone and put in your observations. And I believe it will also include suggestions for some day trips. As the year progresses, we anticipate having more involved Masonic Bicentennial events around the state. These are going to involve having a meal, having a speaker, having an opportunity to look at exhibits that will travel and anyone who attends one of these events will also receive a Masonic Bicentennial ribbon. I have one of the first ones here. I don't know if it can be seen very well, but these are going to be only available at these Masonic events or these Bicentennial events, and they'll be available throughout the year. Uh, once the, the Bicentennial season is over, then they won't be available at all. So I think that's something that many brothers will want to, will want to get. During the upcoming year, and, and really this is going to extend into the next year as well, since our bicentennial runs from April of 2021 to April of 2022, I encourage you all to enjoy these events, to learn more about the history of your fraternity, to learn more about the history of your state, and to share this with your family and friends. There's certainly nothing secret about any of the bicentennial events. There are things that we welcome people to come and see. Anyway, uh, I want you to enjoy tonight's lecture and invite you to enjoy these other events as they come up during the future. Uh, Jacob, thank you very much, and I look forward to hearing the lecture tonight. Thank you, Most Worshipful. Uh, brethren, one of the big endeavors uh, of this project as we move forward with these lectures this year is to explore all the facets of uh, Missouri history as best we can and, and maybe explore some of those things that we often hear some stories about. Uh, sometimes we know some partial facts, sometimes we don't see the whole image. Uh, to that end, uh, our first presentation tonight, uh, I have the honor of, of bringing to you. And it's a presentation I've worked on uh, on and off for some time in, in various variations, and I, I hope you enjoy it. But it's not meant to be comprehensive. I should start off with saying that before we go any further. Uh, we won't be covering every battle, every interaction, uh, and every brother involved A to Z. The idea is to highlight, to emphasize, uh, and, and in that way, uh, perhaps do a little bit of justice to the events that surrounded um, the Civil War in the state of Missouri, uh, as well as Freemasonry in the state of Missouri. So. Just a minute here. 
Right, Worship Brother Kayser, do you see my PowerPoint on your screen? Awesome. So the title of this presentation is The Civil War, Brotherhood, Destruction, the Craft, and Missouri's Place in It All. As a state, Missouri is extremely complex uh, when we talk about the history of the Civil War. Over 110,000 Missourians uh, fought for the Union or the federal government, and at least 30,000 that we know of uh, fought in the Confederate Army, not counting uh, guerrilla bands uh, and various other militia units that weren't conscripted into controlled service of the Confederate Army. Additionally, as a state, we hold a, a rather complex position, and, and many wouldn't probably realize it, but the state of Missouri ranks number three in the number of actual physical engagements in, in terms of battles and skirmishes and, and things along that line that happened within the state borders. Um, over 1,200 of them, um, ranking only behind Tennessee and the state of Virginia. So Missouri, as a state is extremely complex in the level of interactions that occurred here, um, as well as the dynamic of the population. At the time of the Civil War, Missouri was still fairly rural in large portions of the state. Um, St. Louis had had large influxes uh, of immigrants, uh, whether you're talking German or Irish in decades prior, uh, and the large other portions of the state were populated by individuals uh, who had moved from Kentucky, Virginia, North Carolina, Tennessee, uh, a lot of old South states, um, in particular around the Missouri River um, and extending westward. So the dynamic of the state was extremely varying depending where you were at. St. Louis was known to be a strong hub uh, of union sentiment in certain areas, yet large portions of the old money population uh, definitely weren't very pro-union at times. Uh, when you get out to rural areas, you would find communities uh, being solidly unionist or completely mixed uh, or very, very pro-states rights and in that vein of uh, being for the Confederacy. But the state's unique in that dynamic. It, it's unique in the dynamic uh, of the politicians and the individuals who all played a part in it um, and built it to what it became. So before we really dig into some of the dynamics of, of what actually occurred and, and some of the bigger events, I wanna share with you a quote. The great trouble will be that the storm may not only carry them, but also the innocent into civil war, anarchy and confusion. Now that seems a, a pretty that the great trouble is the storm coming. And what could it do? It could carry the innocent into civil war, create anarchy and confusion. That sounds like something, you know, maybe we'd hear right at the start of the civil war, maybe right in the midst of it. Um, but interestingly enough, it was said by most worshipful brother Love S. Cornwall in 1856. In 1856, several years before the war, um, which Generally speaking, tensions were already high. Uh, even after the Missouri Compromise and leading up to the Civil War, as time went on, tensions between those of, of the, who supported the ideas of, of abolition, uh, abolition, as well as the federal right of the government versus those with states' rights, those who uh, were proponents of slavery, all those different things were coming to a head and they were coming in cycles. Uh, but in 1856, you see most worshipful brother Cornwell, make that statement in his address as Grand Master. What's interesting is he could be talking about a whole lot of things. Um, he could be talking a lot about a lot of different animosity. Uh, but what happened rather recently to when he made that address, uh, Charles Sumner was beat on the floor of the Capitol building. Uh, in the House, I believe it's the House of Representatives. He was beat with over an insult. Uh, a northerner, a Massachusetts congressman, uh, attacking a, a southerner, a southern congressman. Uh, pretty aggressive stuff to show the tensions at the time. Well, of course, things did finally boil over. And early 1861 arrives. And by February of that year, after Lincoln's election, 
seven states secede the Union and leave. Um, in April of that same year, uh, so just two months later, February, seven states ship off. April arrives and the Missouri General Assembly tries to leave. The Missouri General Assembly tries to pass an act of secession um, and it fails. It fails in Jefferson City. But what also happens in April of 1861? Well, also in April of 1861, we see Fort Sumter fall and, and the first cannon blasts and first action uh, of the Civil War, uh, the War of Rebellion begins. And that kicks off in South Carolina. But in a lot of ways, while that by many is seen as the flashpoint of the Civil War, uh, at least in terms of armed action, Missourians were used to it in a way. Not that level, but they were used to hearing accounts of it, tales of it. Uh, the ideas of bleeding Kansas, the interactions around the Missouri-Kansas border, uh, the pro-slavery uh, movement, the abolitionist movement, the arguments, the fights, the houses that were burned over it, the towns that were just destroyed by these groups of marauders and such all on the border. Uh, the state of Missouri was bleeding uh, far before uh, any war started in South Carolina. But tensions started to rise in all the states. And, and this is, of course, the same month that Missouri tries to flee the Union. Uh, so obviously, there are Missourians who do not want to answer President Lincoln's call for volunteers. There are obviously people who want to side with the Confederacy. Um, there are others who are very pro-Union, and they want to follow that direction. They want to head that way. Uh, so you have very opposing views, uh, and it comes to head in Missouri's case in what is known as the Camp Jackson Affair. And that occurs just about a month after Fort Sumter. Now, for those who aren't really familiar with how a lot of things worked militarily, if you will, um, up until probably even the 1900s, uh, a lot of local communities had their own militias. Uh, this is, of course, predating the National Guard system. And, and so states had their own militias, communities had their own militias, these units would outfit themselves, drill, uh, and do all these different things to show off their military acumen. Um, show off their skill um, and uh, make every effort to be the big, the big army of the community, if you will. Um, and as such, May 10th, 1861 signals one of those moments when a, counter, a powder keg blows because a militia meets. The Missouri Volunteer Militia of the state was called from St. Louis, uh, where they would were to drill um, and work through uh, their general movements, their training efforts, all those things that, that go with being in a militia, if you will. Um, where they were camped at is now located at the St. Louis University campus. And, and while they were camped there, they set up tents, they went out and drilled in the fields, they practiced maneuvers, um, all these things that could get as much attention uh, as possible, probably from the community. Because when you hold these events, uh, the community would come out and watch. It was like a picnic, it was a festival to them to watch your community and watch the men of your community and your businessmen and, and all these people uh, stepping up to, to walk about and, and march in these flashy uniforms and all these things. Well, at the time, St. Louis uh, was generally not under military control by any means, but an officer by the name of Ca uh, Captain Nathaniel Lyon had been stationed at the arsenal. Uh, his responsibility in part was to ensure that St. Louis uh, stayed, quote unquote, in Union hands. Um, so Captain Lyon uh, is a little bit suspicious about this encampment happening uh, outside of town, um, outside of the area at this Camp Jackson. And for those of you who are familiar with St. Louis, uh, it's important to note that while we think of Lindell Boulevard and where SLU is as part of the city, um, in the 1860s, it was way out in the country. The city of St. Louis ended at Jefferson Street running north and south. So Captain Lyon is suspicious. Uh, 
he does what he thinks is smart. He dresses up as an old woman, gets in a carriage, and takes a carriage ride and rides through the camp um, as an old woman looking around, kind of being a little spy, if you will. Um, of course, he gets made much fun of for that later because uh, he does get spotted. Anyway, when he gets back to the arsenal, he gets back to uh, where he is stationed, he decides that it is a, a very aggressive site, that they are potentially dangerous. And so he rounds up 6,000 Missouri volunteers, mostly German, uh, as well as the U.S. regulars that were stationed in St. Louis at the time. And they marched to Camp Jackson and took 669 prisoners. Now, common sense would dictate if you're on your home soil, you you probably would want to be nice to these guys, at least publicly treating them uh, with a little bit of dignity if you're in a community in which they're idolized, or at least in a community in which the public has been watching them for days, and the public is enthralled by this unit marching and drilling in these flashy unit or uniforms. Well, Captain Lyon just decides to make a big show of it, and under armed guard, marches these prisoners back to the arsenal. And nothing good comes of it. A firefight breaks out on the street. Um, those who were pro-South that were in the crowd began making comments at the German soldiers, uh, the German volunteers calling them things. Uh, sooner or later, somebody shot and then a bunch of rifles went off. The final toll uh, after the angry crowd had been dispersed was 28 civilians killed, 75 wounded. Um, of course, hearing all this, hearing how the federal government had shot down civilians, uh, incited those who were pro-South in the state legislature and in the General Assembly. Um, so they created what they called the Missouri State Guard. And, and they basically uh, brought harmony to all the militia systems in their mind uh, and brought them under one control making the Missouri State Guard the pro-Confederate armed force, basically. Additionally, um, they attempted to pass some highly pro-secessionist orders um, and basically brought it to the point where the governor could be almost a dictator in the level of authority in which he held. Um, this raised a lot of tensions. Um, obviously, reports weren't going well back to Washington, D.C. Uh, President Lincoln wasn't happy. Military leaders weren't happy. Uh, there was a lot of scrambling to how to, how to address the situation. And, and of course, once this happens in St. Louis, it sends shockwaves across the state of Missouri. Um, by federal troops. And to joining with the state guard troops, many young men do. And, and that's really the powder keg that kicks off the war formally, if you will, in the state of Missouri. As I said, we're going to cover a glimpse of, of Missouri in the Civil War. So, so with that being in mind, uh, we're not going to hit on every battle, every interaction, every campaign. Uh, so reasonably, I, I want to highlight a couple things here on the flow of, of real action. Okay, and we'll come back to this map a couple of times. Uh, the blue line represents general overall troop movement and action in the war during 1861. Uh, shortly after the Camp Jackson affair, uh, troops drifted both south and west. Um, and we'll talk about Wilson's Creek a little bit later, as well as Lexington. And after those battles, uh, they then shifted out down into Arkansas. In 1864 is the next massive troop movement we see in the state of Missouri. So 1862, 1863 are, are, are basically marked by a lot of guerrilla warfare, a lot of in and out skirmishes, um, a, a lot of that type of stuff, um, incursion wise, not, not so much mass troop movements. Um, but 1864 is the big troop movement. Sterling Pap. Most of his army is poorly dressed, 
poorly fed, doesn't have shoes, blankets, weapons. They've got pitchforks, sticks, rocks, whatever they could find. Um, and their plan, of course, is to take St. Louis, then take Kansas City and, and, and collect supplies and recruits along the way. Um, they end up, if you can see where my pointer is now on your screen, at the end of this first yellow arrow, right around here, they end up getting uh, a nice stopping point uh, because as green as they were, even with some of their hardened veterans in 1864, uh, they ran into an Iowa infantry regiment uh, that was entirely veteran. Um, and they ran into a fort called Fort Davidson in Pilot Knob, Missouri. That battle slowed them down enough um, and it made that valley around that Fort a killing field in, in such a way that the city of St. Louis and Jefferson City had enough time to completely reinforce themselves, pull troops in, and make it so that when Price's army did move on and they got to St. Louis, they immediately had to turn away. Uh, they skirted Jefferson City, moving towards Kansas City. On the outskirts of Kansas City, they ended up in the town of Westport. Um, and some of you are familiar where Westport is probably. Westport is the largest battle west of the Mississippi River. It was larger than Gettysburg in, in land and numbers. Um, and, and at that engagement, they were turned south again um, and lost and, and headed out of the state down through Arkansas, Oklahoma, and Kansas. Uh, that being the general route that the troop movements would follow at that time. So this is just so you can get kind of a feel of the general wave of troop movement, because we will talk about how these actions affected lodges in a little bit. So with Camp Jackson happening in May, uh, early May, uh, the Grand Lodge of Missouri meets less than 20 days later in the same city. And at this time, uh, the Grand Master is most worshipful brother Marcus McFarland. He is a Democrat from the ground up by his description, which would generally at that time say he was probably pro-South in his leanings. He's a native of Tennessee, but grew up in Missouri, um, is a physician, a past member of the General Assembly, um, and, and very well respected community-wise. He informs the, the brethren in his address that our, our fraternity embraces the whole and bonds of charity. South, no east or west, yet we know our country and our brotherhood everywhere. Peace and harmony are the mission of our order. Whatever individuals may feel to be their duty as citizens, let us not forget our brotherhood. Let no bitter personal animosity spring up among us. Let us remember the fraternal cord and its duties. We can do most of the present with all men especially with those of our own household. May the God of love keep you all in harmony and brotherly love. That's an interesting sentiment from somebody. Um, he, he lived about an, what is now an hour's drive uh, north of St. Louis. He lived in Lincoln County, uh, north of Troy, Missouri. Um, but he makes it pretty clear here. You know, Camp Jackson leaves a, a pretty harsh stain on the state. Um, shortly before Camp Jackson, um, Sterling Price and Claiborne Fox, the then governor, had ran through the state telling everyone that the Union was going to burn every house and kill every man, woman, and child, uh, or something along that lines. They had published uh, in various ways. But here you have the Grand Master of the State reminding our brothers uh, of, the, of the tenets of Masonry that we disregard all those directions, uh, that we need to not let that animosity spring up among us. Uh, we need to remember the fraternal cord and its duties. And then if we remember those things, we can hopefully assuage some of the bitterness. Um, but he says the, these beautiful words just, just about, you know, 20 days later after Camp Jackson um, had occurred. Uh, he then shortly after leaves office and the brother that they elect as Grand Master is most worshipful brother William Pennick. Brother Pennick uh, is installed, but never actually sits as Grand Master uh, in an annual communication, and we'll talk about him later. Uh, he was a staunch and ardent Unionist, uh, and that gets him, you could say, into a little bit of hot water, uh, but we'll, we'll address that momentarily. 
Time rolls on. Um, Wilson's Creek occurs just several months after the interactions uh, and the skirmishes uh, that followed the Camp Jackson affair. This uh, illustration you see here illustrates uh, Captain Lyon, uh, that guy who dressed up as an old lady and went through the Confederate or state militia camp at the time, uh, was struck down at Wilson's Creek and shot. Um, he died there at that battle. Um, but Wilson's Creek is, is in the Springfield, Missouri area, of course. Uh, there were few lodges down there, uh, but they had grown in years prior to that. And, and some of the effect of this battle and the military interactions uh, probably had something to do with uh, the end result of several lodges that we'll, we'll touch on in a bit. Now, less than a month after Wilson's Creek, we see the Battle of Lexington. Wilson's Creek was a big morale boost for the Confederate troops, for the State Guard uh, in Missouri, and, and for Sterling Price. Um, it gave them such a morale boost that instead of doing anything else, they didn't head away like they, they, they ended up doing later in the year. They pushed north, and they pushed north to Lexington. Uh, and in Lexington, uh, we find the beautiful Masonic College up on a hill overlooking the river. Um, the image you see there, we'll look at a little bit closer in a moment, but that is the, the college after the battle. Masonic College had been located there for some time. A at the point of the Civil War, it had basically ceased to operate as a school. Um, it, it had been shut down for a, a little bit. Uh, they were still handling some financial issues with it um, in, in terms of scholarships and, and completing some, some things like that. Uh, but it wasn't functioning as a school at that point. Uh, took possession of the college, built fortifications around it, uh, in part because uh, it was situated high up on a hill overlooking uh, the Missouri River and a portion of the town. The Confederate forces attempted to make the attack uh, on the hill and on the college. That's where this battle gets the name of the Battle of Hemp Bales. Uh, not frequently referenced as that, but the Confederate troops decided that if they could find a way to block the bullets, that'd be a good idea. And they went down by the river and found warehouses with massive bales of hemp. Uh, they figured if you soak them in water and then they get hit with hot musket balls, they won't catch fire. Uh, they then attempted to soak some of those bales, uh, but the weight of them, they couldn't even get them out of the water. Uh, they then figured out if they maybe kept them on land and poured a little bit of water on them and then pushed them, it would work. Uh, and so that was actually attempted, uh, rolling these hemp bales up a hill and using them as, as basically a, a shield. Shields. Um, of course, the battle rages on, and, and, and the two individuals involved uh, primarily uh, were Colonel, that we hear about relating to this battle, is Colonel Benjamin W. Grover and Sterling Price. Sterling Price is an interesting figure in Missouri history. He's well respected as a military leader by 100% of the population. Uh, in fact, he's referred to as Pat Price. Uh, he was a, a strong military leader in the Mexican War. Um, and, and for that reason, because of the respect he had, he became the, the fit and well-respected leader of the Missouri uh, Confederate forces. But Sterling Price makes his push trying to take Lexington. In the midst of it, Colonel Benjamin W. Grover is mortally wounded. Uh, Brother Grover, a grandmaster in the early 1850s, uh, is struck and, and does die uh, of his wounds sustained there. Over time, though, of course, the, unions having the, high, the Union forces having the high ground, uh, they're able to hold off for a while, uh, but they do run out of ammunition um, and, and they are forced to surrender. Sterling Price is, is so appreciative of their valor, so respecting of their service, that he actually orders that they not be harassed uh, in any form and be allowed to withdraw from their position in the city uh, and the field, uh, which they then do. Now, while this battle is, is, of course, going on, there are some other things that have happened. We talked earlier about the legislator uh, attempting to secede, uh, which failed. Uh, then at another point, um, they 
passed some legislation that was fairly pro-secessionist, if not outwardly stating it. Well, at this point, uh, the governor has disappeared. He's been declared a traitor, and we'll talk about him in a moment. Uh, but the federal government, basically, with President Lincoln's actions, uh, places Hamilton Gamble, a, a br Missouri brother, uh, at the charge. And, and Brother Gamble, Gamble serves as the provisional governor of Missouri uh, through most of the Civil War, uh, seeking to maintain Missouri's place in the Union, uh, as well as keep the state functioning in, in that ad administrative aspect. This is the college, like I said, after the battle. Um, you can notice uh, one of the columns has, has quite a bit of a mark on it. Another one has another mark. Um, several places where cannonballs hit the building um, and definitely it was pockmarked uh, by musket fire as well. Now, as, as all this is moving, as all these things are, are shifting around in the background, those, those other in, individuals involved in the General Assembly, uh, those who were pro-secessionists, who had been forced out uh, because of their views, um, those who had been forced to flee because of Hamilton Gamble's appointment, fled south. Uh, and one of those was Claiborne Fox Jackson, the governor or former governor of the state. And he left with 49 members of the legislature, and they moved to Neosho. Uh, and there in Neosho, it, it, it said in the Masonic Hall, they met, declared secession from the Union, and they passed acts which made Missouri part of the Confederacy. Um, and, and for those who aren't aware, uh, the Confederate government did recognize that to some degree, uh, as generally speaking, there was a star always included uh, for Missouri on their flags. Um, now, there is a little bit of error in this situation, and, and people will call semantics about it. Uh, Claiborne Fox Jackson was the elected legitimate governor of the state. So were those 49 representatives. Uh, but by the time they made this declaration, they were not in the situated seat of government. They were in the seat of government they established. They had already been labeled traitors and fugitives and held no direct authority. Uh, so you can argue if you think really what they did was legitimate uh, or just uh, in their minds a legitimate act supported by uh, the population that they hoped would support them. The next individual we'll, we'll briefly talk about is, is somebody who stirred the pot a little bit uh, after Wilson's Creek. Um, and, and around the time of the Battle of Lexington, and his name is Most Worshipful Brother Pennock. Originally from the St. Joe Independence area, generally speaking. Um, he was elected Grand Master after Most Worshipful Brother McFarland. Um, he served as an officer in the Union Army, and he conducted all of his business as Grand Master from the field. Um, he, he wrote his Grand Master's address from the field. He issued dispensations from the field. Um, he, he received uh, correspondence from other Grand Lodges and gifts from other Grand Lodges in the field, forwarding them on to, to the Grand Secretary at the time. Generally, he is reported to have been a colonel in the 5th Missouri Militia Cavalry, um, which was a pro-union uh, local group, basically, uh, to some degree, um, where he served. And he served through the ranks. Uh, I believe he was elected as a major then promoted to lieutenant colonel and lastly colonel. Uh, as time went on, he was elevated uh, to be the brigadier general of the state militia over Northwest Missouri. Um, and he had charge of a lot of the policing, if you will, of William Quantrell uh, and the, the guerrilla activity that happened in that part of the state. He was an ardent unionist. Uh, and generally speaking, it's reported that he was extremely aggressive. Um, he, was, he was not somebody to be trifled with as a military officer. Um, it, it sounds like, from most reports I've read on him, uh, in, in terms of bringing the hammer down, uh, he, he brought the hammer down. Uh, he didn't care for anyone who, who did not favor the Union. Well, in his address as Grand Master, he, he says a couple things that, that rankled not only local feathers, but also stirred some issues with Grand Lodges around the country. Um, 
In his address, he states plainly that I have decided lately that a traitor to the government of the United States is not entitled to a Masonic burial or any other benefits of Masonry. Um, that was part of his address. He then began to talk about several brothers who had died in battle, uh, including um, our friend we just our friend we just spoke about, uh, Colonel Benjamin Grover, who died at Lexington, as well as most worshipful brother Benjamin Sharp, who we'll talk about shortly. Uh, some of his statements regarding those brothers and their passing uh, were very, very political, uh, at least in, in the old school sentiment of it and, and what he said. And because of that, um, he did receive a little bit of a rebuke uh, by the grand body the next year after his decisions had been reviewed. Uh, in particular, they decided that it should be struck, what he said about the grand masters, and that a mason in good standing was entitled to burial and no denial of the rights or benefits of masonry. In part, their report said that looking alone to the future welfare and the prosperity of our noble fraternity and expressly disclaiming any discourtesy to our grandmaster for whom we have the highest sentiments of regard and respect, we would recommend therefore that the portion of his address together with uh, so much as regards to the manner of the death of our late brother, past grandmaster Sharp, be laid on the table and omitted from the published proceedings. Um, and, and so that basically turned his, his recommendation over. Um, and, and there were several other Grand Lodges that voiced concern about it uh, at the time, at least in correspondence, as it had made its rounds. But as we said, uh, Most Worship Brother Pennock was a, an ardent unionist, uh, extremely active in the cause of the union. And it's said that leading up to the war and after the war, uh, he helped found a group known as the Unconditional Union Club. It was a secret order. Uh, it, it appears to have branches, but it was basically made of the most ardent unionist you could find. Um, but uh, that's a little bit about Most Worship Brother Pennock, uh, a very opinionated leader, but an active military man, uh, and, and one who is highly respected uh, in, in his achievements as a military leader uh, for what he did. Now, I, I do want to take a bit of a sidetrack here because this is important uh, to the time frame. Um, with the war raging, with everything going on, there's always other things that filter through that, that pop up on the radar. Um, and there's other things that can be stirring in the background of masonry and, if you will, the Masonic politics of the time. One of these things was the conservators. Uh, the Conservators were, was an organization arranged in, in by Robert Morris, uh, began in June of 1860. Brother Morris was the, or most worship Brother Morris is a past Grand Master of the Grand Lodge of Kentucky, and he's well known as the founder of the Order of Eastern Star. Uh, the general sentiments of the Grand Lodge of Missouri at the time towards the Conservators uh, were not pleasant, uh, and history shows that pretty well. Uh, because of what they were attempting to do. Um, without turning this into a conservator's presentation, uh, the simplest way to describe their effort is to say it was an attempt to uh, subversively introduce standardized work in the manner of the slow, gradual implementation into jurisdictions that primarily work by mouth to ear. Uh, you would receive a letter in the mail from him saying, hey, you're a respected guy, we like you, we trust you. Here's what we want to do. If you're good with it, sign this letter, mail it back. If you're not good with it, destroy it. Don't ever tell anybody about it. If you agree to it, he'd communicate with you more. He'd provide you with their cipher and, and those types of things. Existing records show that the Grand Lodge of Missouri had at least 16 brothers who were involved, including at least one future Grand Master uh, who did serve one term as our Grand Lecturer, and that is most worshipful brother Thomas E. Garrett. Uh, what's intriguing about that is that Missouri, obviously, like I said, wasn't a fan. They didn't like the idea of somebody else coming in and, and slowly implementing their version of the ritual. So Missouri issues what's known as the Conservator's Oath, uh, and, and it's a pretty harsh deal. Um, they require anybody who visits a lodge to take it, uh, as well as, as brothers within to take it at some point. 
And it basically just says, you know, I solemnly declare my honor as a Mason. I've never belonged to the association. I don't belong to it now. And I'll, I'll denounce it. I'll repudiate it. And I won't be connected with it. Um, it came off pretty harsh. The next year, they did tone it down just a little bit from being so aggressive. Um, but it was used. It was actively used as you had visitors um, and brothers from outside the jurisdiction to prove that they were not conservators. Um, of course, uh, Morris's project did take off in several states. It, it caused several issues. Um, at one point, the Grand Secretary of Missouri, who was very active in Grand Yorkite bodies, attempted to visit a grand uh, conclave in the state of Illinois. And the Grand Lodge of Illinois actually attempted to bar him from attending on the grounds of the things he had said about conservators. Um, but anyway, it led to a lot of tension. By 1864, uh, Robert Morris actually wrote a letter to the Grand Lodge of Missouri and published it publicly in national Masonic periodicals. It was titled, A Solemn Protest Directed at the Masonic Brethren of Missouri. Um, he probably shouldn't have wrote it uh, because the Grand Master of Missouri followed it up with a very public comment that if Mr. Morris is wise, he will not meddle in our jurisdiction. Um, and, and he was pretty plain with his comments after that as well. But it's important that we know that there are other things happening. Masonry didn't completely stop. Uh, lodges were still functioning. Things were rolling along. And there were other movements and activities in the craft, all while uh, hundreds of thousands of, of brothers are, are fighting in this conflict. Now, many lodges have stories connected to the Civil War. Some of them are, are very well recorded, some not. So I, I want to share briefly one that actually, to me, pops up as the most apparent instance in our Civil War, coming to us uh, from Northeast Missouri, uh, Clarksville Lodge. Clarksville Lodge uh, no longer exists, uh, but it sits in a, would have sat in a picturesque river town, just about an hour and a half, an hour 45 north of St. Louis and Mississippi River. This story comes to us from 1861. As most worshipful brother Pennick is the Grand Master. Um, but it begins actually earlier than Pennock's term. It begins uh, during Most Worship Brother McFarland's term uh, and then comes to a head under Pennock's watch. In April of 1861, Clarksville Lodge has their election. The master of the lodge is reinstalled. Uh, in the course of his installation, there's a report, a report that he refused to give his assent to certain public ancient charges, in particular, not to be engaged in plots and conspiracies against the government. Um, now that's the, the accusation. Um, nothing happened that several months went by. Um, and then a letter is written to the Grand Master, Most Worship Brother Pennock, and they say, hey, we don't think that guy actually gave the assent to it. We think there's something wrong here. We don't think he should be in office. Um, we've already discussed Most Worship Brother Pennock's political leanings. Um, so he immediately sends the DDGM to go inspect this, the D District Deputy Grand Master. Uh, the DDGM at the time is actually a member of Clarksville Lodge. Uh, so a little bit of conflict of interest perhaps on that. But he gets there. He meets with the master, Most Worshipful Brother Hempel. And Most Worshipful Brother Hempel flat out tells him, I assented to the charge, but I've got, I've got political reservations. I, I've got problems with it. I'm he doesn't flat out say he's pro he's pro Confederacy, pro the South, but he says I've got reservations, and I'll restrain those as master. I'll hold them back. I won't discuss them. I know my duty. Uh, the deputy dwells on this for a little bit, uh, but then he just decides to remove the master from office, arrest the charter, uh, and shut the lodge down based on the idea that there was a plotter against the government recently attending the lodge. So not even the master, not even that situation, but that there was a plotter uh, against the government in the room. Uh, and he was referencing the then junior ward of the lodge, uh, who was a member of that lodge and had recently been known to have served with Sterling Price. Of course, all of that has to go to Grand Lodge and be reviewed. Uh, and, and it is reviewed. Um, and, and the committee that takes it to task uh, comes down fast and very clear 
They censure the deputy's actions. They call it a violation of the ancient charges and constitutions and of our ancient brethren's actions. They offer a resolution immediately declaring the district deputy grandmasters illegal. They restore the charter and they reinstate the master of the lodge. Um, so simply by some political opinions, uh, the water gets pretty hot. And then it, of course, recedes after cooler heads review it, realizing the tenets of our craft and our ancient charges. That's one lodge. But what about all the other lodges in the state? What about the other impacts? We talked about this earlier, the paths of movement, um, the interactions that, that were involved. This isn't to say these are the only areas. Uh, there was heavy action up. Uh, on the Iowa-Missouri line at one point shortly, uh, as well as other places along the Mississippi River. Uh, but these are the general routes worth noting. Between 1861 and 1862, the, the Grand Secretary, uh, Right Worship Brother Anthony O'Sullivan, makes a pretty startling report. Um, now, he has not been in St. Louis for, for a little while. He's actually been living in Springfield, Missouri. Um, supposedly, um, on a bit of his own mission. He publicly tells the Grand Lodge in his report that year that uh, there are a lot of charters or a lot of lodges that were chartered in Southwest Missouri and South Missouri that should never have been chartered. Um, he basically says that the brethren down there are underqualified, underfunded, um, and it wasn't appropriate for us to do it and we got in too big of a hurry. And that's part of the reason he's down there is to assess those lodges and shut them down. It, it's paraphrasing his, his discussion. But the next year, uh, in that 60, 1863 report, he reports that between 1861 and 62, 89 lodges ceased to work. Um, and, and I'll tell you, his math doesn't completely make sense to me when I add all the numbers through, uh, but he says 89 lodges ceased working or were thought to be. Uh, that includes lodges who failed to make a return. 23 lodges lost their halls, furnishing record to fire. 15 lodges disappeared without a trace, and 51 lodges failed to pay their per capita, their, their dues to Grand Lodge. Uh, along this background, though, annual communication has still been happening. Occasionally, there's some grand officers or other officers from various lodges missing, but annual communication still goes on. The lodges are still functioning otherwise. But taking into account these numbers, we stumble on this map. Um, as you can note, if there's a red star, that indicates a lodge that burned. Black means they went down or were gone down. I'm not too sure exactly what uh, Anthony O'Sullivan meant by that, but that was his general reference uh, to lodges that were gone down. Gold stars illustrate lodges like Kansas City 220 was robbed. Uh, buildings were destroyed. At least one lodge surrendered its charter outright. Uh, one lodge just reported that its members dispersed. We don't know what happened of its building or anything like that. Uh, and at least one lodge is said to have suspended labor. Now, all the stars you see here on your screen, these are lodges that just cease to function, period, that we know of for, a statistic, for an actual reason. Uh, for an actual reason. What happens when we lay down the ones that failed to make a return? All of these stars are lodges that did not make returns that year. So they didn't uh, get the proper funds back to the Grand Lodge. They didn't submit the proper paperwork and includes one state or one lodge that was out uh, in another state, Bent Lodge. So when we lay those two maps on top of each other, you can see an interesting layout. Um, and this re respectively shows you some of the hot spots of the war. Uh, 1861, we had the Battle of Athens and some other activity up in the Iowa-Missouri corner. Um, along the Missouri-Kansas border, you see lots of lodges burned, robbed, and dispersed. You see areas where a lot of grill activity occurred. Um, what you do notice is places around St. Louis, the Ozarks. Uh, the Ozarks not as populated at the time, but not a lot of activity there. Um, in, in terms of lodge loss. Um, but this is pretty prolific when you look at the impact of what happened. In one year, this, is, this accounts for one year of the Grand Secretary's report of lodges that 
failed to make returns or were destroyed in one manner or another. Of course, what's interesting is Anthony O'Sullivan makes this report, and about three or four months later, we have the famed um, number or general order number 11. Uh, and this is the, the uh, Caleb Bingham, George Caleb Bingham painting uh, of that. Order 11 cleared out uh, the rural areas in several counties along the edge of the state and, and basically made you move into town or move into towns. Um, because uh, the military action was seeking to quell guerrilla warfare, was seeking to quell support for pro-Confederate forces. Uh, so their option was just clear the country out, leave nothing there. Uh, it's often one of the reasons attributed to the idea of the Burnt District, which were several of these states along the Kansas line, uh, which traditionally, even to this day, you can't really go there and find any houses that date to the Civil War or earlier left. Very, very, very few and far between because most were destroyed. Uh, because as those individuals moved out of the country to the more populated points where they were allowed to live, um, pro-Confederate uh, marauders, partisan rangers, guerrilla forces, uh, even uh, Union forces would go onto those properties, forage, take what they needed, burn what they didn't so that the other army didn't get those supplies. A little bit more detail from that same year's report from most or from right worship brother Anthony O'Sullivan. Uh, just a couple highlights. He's very brief in how he describes what happened to these lodges. He tells us Rawls Lodge, uh, the lodge was burned, the jewels and furniture and charter destroyed. Washburn Lodge was robbed, its members dispersed, but the charter is safe. Kansas City Lodge number 220, the lodge room was robbed. Uh, he also reports a couple interesting things. Uh, he did end up with all, and I bless his heart because I don't know where he'd store it, all of the furniture uh, top to bottom of Tuscumbia Lodge uh, after they closed down. Uh, but he also received a charter of Washington Lodge number 12 of Fayetteville, Arkansas. From, and it was given to him by brother B.F. Little of Pioneer Lodge number 22, Iowa. Um, I would take it from the exchange that probably Brother Little was in the military. Um, at least at one other point, uh, Right Worship Brother O'Sullivan thanks and applauds those brothers in the service who practice Masonic virtue, uh, who have saved charters, conveyed to him property of lodges, uh, and helped maintain some semblance of, of, of the mystic tie during the war. Um, he also then chastises those who did not. I did mention uh, Brother Sharp earlier. Uh, he was referenced by Nick in his address, and uh, it's a rather sad little case here. Uh, Brother Sharp looks like a very nice gentleman, um, and he's an interesting guy. Brother Sharp was a native of Virginia. He was a strong unionist, though, even though he even attended the Virginia Military Institute. Uh, the same place that, not at the same time, but same place where Stonewall Jackson taught. Brother Sharp was a member of Danville Lodge in Montgomery County, and he served as the Grand Master of Masons of the state of Missouri in 1853. Uh, in July of 1861, uh, he was a very prominent lawyer in the community. Um, he was leaving his residence in the Danville, Missouri area, heading north to Martinsburg. On the way, he was shot by bushwhackers. Uh, they don't really say who or what in any of the accounts, just that he was shot by bushwhackers. Um, and then we leave it a bit up to the, the propaganda, perhaps, of the time. Several accounts say that he, after being shot, left his buggy, got down on his knees, and he prayed for God to protect his family, forgive his sins, and grant that the armies of the Union might be successful, and the Union itself preserved to his posterity forever. So all of those things happen sporadically throughout the war. Uh, of course, there's a lot of different interactions occurring and we can find various other accounts of lodges being destroyed, property ruined, uh, but, but tensions still remain high even after the war. And we know this from, from a lot of other accounts and Missouri's in no way different. Uh, 
1865, it's reported to the Graham Astor by Wright Worshipful Brother Thomas Howe, or at least in the proceedings of that point, but much earlier, that the DDGM, who then oversaw Macon County, uh, said, owing to the unsettled state of the country, the difficulties are rising over which I have no control, and believing, as I believe now, that masonry does not compel me or require me to risk my life in the open field before a vastly superior force of the enemy, I felt warranted and justified in abandoning the field. So on the 6th of July, 1864, I left the bounds of my district and have not been there since. He then tenured his resignation and was replaced. Um, how you read that is up to you, whether he's talking about being outnumbered by Union troops in their presence uh, or uh, partisan guerrillas and, and Confederate forces. By, the, by July of 1864, uh, he'd likely be talking just about guerrillas or the Union militia presence of the time. Now, Wright Worship Brother Howe's replacement comes in, uh, and he actually writes in his report uh, that he finds all the difficulty and lukewarmness in the different lodges, which are results from allowing political prejudice to rule the hour. I have, as far as possible, rebuked the argument of some superlative loyal, loyally brother, loyal brethren, that if a brother is charged with disloyal feelings, he is not entitled to Masonic esteem. Um, so there's a lot of brothers who just don't care for each other because, hey, he was pro-Confederate. He was pro-Union. He was for the South. He was for the North. Well, I don't like him anymore. And, and so we see multiple accounts of DDGMs addressing this, talking about it, uh, endeavoring to work to quell the opinions um, and, and to endeavor to not allow politics to enter the portals or mar the beauty of masonry. Most worship brother John Houston, who was the Grand Master the year these reports were being made, uh, tells everyone in his report that in May of 1865, he had to, uh, in May of 1865, he makes his report that in December of that prior year, so December of 1864, uh, he visits Lafayette Lodge in Lexington, Missouri the site of that big battle, uh, to help confer degree work. He gets asked to help confer degree work. So he goes there to help. And he finds the lodge in an unfortunate and deplorable feeling existing because of political opinions. In, in fact, he finds it to where brothers won't even talk to each other on the streets. Um, and that bothers him so much, he directs the secretary to summon every craftsman who is not legally suspended or expelled and who lives in the county to meet him in that lodge room on the third Saturday in January of 1865. So the Grand Master was that bothered by it that he has the secretary contact every single Mason in the county. Legally a brother within the bounds of not being suspended or excelled and summons them to show up in lodge, giving them a due summons. Um, now the weather that night was very inclement and I, I clipped it out of here, but it was actually some of the worst they said of the, of, the years that it surrounded it. But when he got there, he found the lodge room filled. Many of the brothers who were in that lodge hadn't been in a lodge in over three years. And the result of that evening's labor, as he quotes a distinguished brother, was a regular old fashioned Masonic love fest. <laughs> and each brother plighting his faith anew over our sacred altar to live in a future as a society of friends and brothers. So. He lays it out there right there for us that he walks into this terribly tense situation. And by the end of it, everybody sees the good of Masonry again and they're renewed in their obligations. He tells us that the prospect of a substantial and permanent peace becomes brighter every day. With this great blessing bestowed upon us, many, very many of our absent brethren whom we used to greet in the past will return to Missouri and those brothers who are going to come back, he tells us, he's very honest. He says, those brothers who've been fighting, they're going to come back broken in their health and their spirits. They may be destitute, scarcely, scarcely able to sustain themselves. And he says, do not, I entreat you, my brethren, add to their misery by failing to recognize them as brothers. My brothers, let us do unto our returning brethren all kind and affectionate acts as become Masons. Make them feel, if they never felt before, that the mysterious chain of masonry, 
though through true and tried heated furnace is a strong and enduring as the immutable laws of truth and justice. And I think that's a beautiful charge. And that's a beautiful statement to tell brothers as they're coming out of this war that was, was so much brother versus brother. You know, brothers, it's time we, we address the matter. We step forward, we act like Masons, and we work to build a better future. And, and he says it in, in, in so many other ways, but, but he lays the, the tread for us. Um, so the last thing I'll end you with is just kind of an interesting couple pictures. Uh, as I said, everybody has some type of story uh, with a lodge or a family member relating to this, in, this time period or, or some other time period uh, where they have one of those interesting stories. And, and as Masons are often concerned with history, many lodges have some uh, curious event that happened. This one was actually a, a short story that was passed to me uh, by several accounts and it's been verified in the, the area of Troy, Missouri, uh, one of the lodges I belong to. What you see on your screen is a, a block house, a Civil War guard house, uh, or a guard house during the Civil War that was elected on a, or erected on a street corner in Troy, Missouri. Um, where it now stands, there's a city park. Across from that guard house, the guard house being about where my mouse is right now doing circles, sat this building right here. This second story of this building with the uh, cupola there and the spire, the second story was the lodge. That's where Troy Lodge number 34 met from about 1842 up until the uh, early 1900s. Um, downstairs was a universalist church and then later a store, but the lodge met on this floor. What's interesting though, is, is you look up here at the very top at the weather vane. There are bullet holes in the globe and in the vein. There are multiple accounts that the Union troops would sit in the blockhouse and practice with their muskets, shooting at the cupola of the Masonic Lodge <laughs> uh, that rested across the street. Um, but that's just one of, of a simple and more lighter hearted, if any can be lighter hearted, stories that come from uh, interactions of masonry in, in the Civil War. The Civil War was a, a dark period of our history and our nation as brothers fought brothers, both in the biological and fraternal sense. We can do no true thorough review of it in any way, but I hope tonight offered you a brief glimpse uh, of several of the aspects uh, of the uh, entire situation as it relates to Missouri, Missouri Freemasonry uh, and the war. Um, this, this engagement um, and the interactions of soldiers and brothers wasn't often well recorded. Uh, generally speaking, if you looked proceedings other than, than comments that are not always direct by the Grand Masters, uh, the Grand Secretary is the most upfront usually. Uh, and he's generally speaking about lodges that just didn't pay or send in returns. Um, but either way, they show the wrath of war, the wrath of action, uh, when man is on a purpose and they, they set themselves to tasks, whether good, bad, or different, and they put themselves behind it. Yet, uh, I, I do again echo those words of, of most worshipful brother Houston, uh, as he noticed and said that in whatever we do and whatever they did, we return to our brothers with those affectionate acts as become Masons and make those who return feel as if they never felt before the mysterious chain of masonry through tried and true lessons after the efforts that have been thrice heated in a furnace, creating a strong and enduring proof of our fraternity's continuity, its principles, and its bulwarks. So with that, I thank you for your attention, brethren, and we'll open the floor for some questions if there are any. And you can unmute yourself, brothers. Additionally, if you want to ask a question, there is the option uh, to raise your hand, uh, which you'll need to go, uh, and you can figure that one out. That's pretty easy in itself. 
So any questions, you can unmute yourself and go ahead, brethren. We'll open just for a little bit. Once, twice. Let me check the chat if we have anything out there. Go ahead, Brother Shanti. Right, Worshipful Shanti. Yes, not a question, but just uh, an illustration. It's something that just happened uh, to show how deeply the emotions are running right now. Uh, the Worshipful Master may remember the monument up on Clark Street in Jefferson City, where Sterling Price looked at the defenses and decided not, not to attack Jefferson City and turned west. That monument's now been destroyed. Uh, it was uh, voted on by the city council uh, to take it down. And one of the stated reasons was, well, it misrepresented history because it's, it, it indicated that General Price decided uh, benevolently to leave the city alone. <laughs> I don't know how they got that, but just show you the feelings right now. True. And one thing I would point out, and I meant to mention when I talked about uh, Sterling Price uh, as a respected individual, and I wish I would have a picture of it. And I, I think if Right Worship Brother Trotler is on here, I, he may have had a picture I could have snagged from him. Um, if you ever go to Bell Fountain Cemetery in St. Louis, there are, there's several plots that are owned by the Green Lodge or were at one time by the home and, and that type of thing. Um, one of those plots where Right Worship Brother O'Sullivan is buried, um, among others, just about I would say five or six plots down is a massive, and I mean massive, obelisk. And it was paid for by his troops. It's where Sterling Price is buried. And it is, it is a beast. Um, he was extremely well respected by his men. Um, he was well regarded in the state. That's why he was known as Sterling Pat Price, Pappy. Um, but but his, his raid, uh, is one of the more interesting things that ever went on uh, in terms of preparedness because um, he came in with a highly underprepared army um, that, uh, that uh, took a huge punch at Pilot Knob uh, but gave St. Louis enough time to defend it and, and Jeff City as well. Uh, and then they rolled, of course, to Westport and met McPherson and, and it just went worse there. Um, but um, there's a lot of beauty and some of the statements that we see from the Grand Masters that happened in the Civil War. When we talk about brotherhood uh, and fellowship and those types of things, um, and, it, and it's intriguing, you know, when we look at uh, Most Worship Brother Cornwell's statement in 56 and, and some of these guys afterwards, you, you see these ideas about the tensions of the time, and, and it almost reflects something we would see more today in, in one way or another, um, but, but I, I didn't realize they had taken that down, Bill. Thank you for letting me know since I've been by that. Appreciate it. Yeah, it, it only just happened. And it happened, the city council took a vote, and I think there were only two dissenters. And within two days of them taking the vote, that thing came down. Yeah. Any other questions, thoughts, comments out there, brothers? Hey, Jacob, this is Byron. Yeah, Byron. How are you, sir? Uh, looking at stuff from a different perspective as usual. <clears throat> You know, I was listening to some of the things that the grandmasters wrote about Confederate Union. Mm -hmm. You take them same statements and change the black and white, they'd be as relevant today as they was back then. Yeah. 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 I, 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 I honestly, I agree with that wholeheartedly. Yeah. There, there's some, some of those statements are, are, they're just so well thought out, but they can apply to the current time. Um, that's for sure. Good point. A any other brothers, anybody? Um, Wayne Sermon, I'm actually from Mobile, Alabama, but I am an endowed member of the Lodge of Research, Missouri. Uh, I also serve as the chairman of our Bicentennial Planning Committee. Uh, <laughs> we've turned uh, 200 in June of this coming year. And there's some things I'm going to send you about that. But I did notice we mentioned Washington Lodge in uh, Fayetteville, Arkansas. Mm -hmm. Did you say the number was 12? Uh, I believe that's what they had in the proceedings. Okay, I, I, well. The, <laughs> the, the story behind it, it, and 
right worshipful brother of Sullivan notes it. Now I'd have to pull it up to double check, but he mentions that it was handed over to him that the charter was actually out of, I think, Tennessee. Uh, it, he had a whole lineage to it. it. If anybody is aware of Anthony O'Sullivan and, and, and some of his efforts, he was a, a prolific brother on several levels. Um, but he was also one of those people that researched it and did a bunch of that type of stuff, digging deep on, on lineage. And, and he makes a comment in his address that along the lines of it also being related to Tennessee, and that he would return it to whatever place first came to him. Um, okay. but I think that's the number I do believe he reported it at. Okay. Whether that's right or different. Uh, yeah, Washington Lodge uh, was originally chartered uh, from Tennessee. It was number 80, all right, uh, 82. Uh, and that was in 1835. And then uh, a couple of years later, they formed the Grand Lodge of Arkansas with three lodges. Uh, and one of those was Washington which becomes Washington number one and uh, Mount Hebron Lodge uh, was number three and it was under dispensation from Alabama. And that's why I know a little more about Arkansas than I normally would. Uh, so I think it may have been number one instead of 12, but uh, I'll see you the background on that um, as, as far as uh, that particular lodge. Uh, one of the things we're doing for our bicentennial is we're going to uh, visit two lodge areas that we chartered uh, one of them's in Tallahassee. That lodge is uh, 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 Andrew Jackson, number one, Tallahassee. We're going to go there and show them how they did the Master Mason degree the first time they did it. And then we're going to travel to Arkansas and do a similar thing, uh, which is in a, now it's a historic park. And the town's name is Washington. Uh, but they um, uh, preserved uh, the, all the buildings of that small town. And so they still have a courthouse uh, where the lodge met upstairs in the 1830s up through uh, past the, uh, the American Civil War. And so we're hoping to be able to travel, but they've got to open their park up before we can do that. And so uh, I think your talk very interesting. Um, uh, in Alabama, while we did have some unionists in the northern part of the state, mainly they just said, we just don't want to bother with anything. Uh, and Mobile actually voted against seceding from the union. Uh, we had, uh, uh, it sounded like Missouri didn't have uh, military lodges chartered. No. We chartered 19 from, Mobile, from Alabama. There, there was a discussion, actually. That was one thing I meant to mention. There was at least one request to charter a military lodge, and it, it basically just dissipated. Uh, Missouri chartered one, I believe, during the Mexican War. Correct me if I'm wrong, Most Horse Brother Hess. Uh, but the attempts during the Civil War, I think, if I can remember right, I think it was the 41st Missouri volunteers or something had asked for it to be chartered to get a military charter. And, and it basically died, I think on its own, probably from nobody following up and, and going through with it. But I know there was discussion on it. Okay. And, and briefly looked over it and then just, uh, yeah. Yeah. Right. Where's brother hunt? Uh, brother Thompson, a very interesting presentation. I'm bringing you greetings from our from a, our Grand Lodge, which is 287 years old, Massachusetts. And it's all <laughs> so you know we we appreciate the uh, the youthful uh, Grand Lodge of Missouri celebrating its 200th anniversary, and I congratulate you and and also the Grand Lodge of Alabama on its uh, on its uh, fraternity. Uh, it's always interesting to see a perspective of something as momentous as the Civil War from a completely different angle. Uh, Massachusetts, our relationship with the Civil War, of course, is the 54th Massachusetts, the, the famous uh, Black Regiment, and also that we chartered military lodges that served in various places. Uh, but in any case, I, I'm glad to see that uh, my, my friend, most virtual brother Hess, is keeping you, uh, keeping you well informed and making sure that history is disseminated to the brethren. Uh, I'm a historian for Grand Lodge of Massachusetts, and uh, uh, I'm, I did have a chance to speak at uh, Grand Lodge, Missouri, three years ago and really enjoyed uh, meeting with the brethren there. So I wish you all the luck in uh, continuing with this, this series. And uh, it was very entertaining. I, I very much enjoyed it. Thank you, sir. Glad That's to have you. Yeah, if anything I can ever do for you, just let me know. Appreciate it. All right. Thank you. A any other questions, brothers? Uh, I do have something I'm going to try to share as we're talking real quickly. Any other questions? Going once, going twice. Any other comments? Right. Um, 
I did have a brother send me a picture of the obelisk and I'm, my text just not wanting to play ball right now or I'd show you uh, what Sterling Price's this grave does look like. Uh, it is actually very rather impressive uh, on, on the street where it sits. But uh, beyond that, brothers, I, I thank you for your attention and time. I'll tend the floor over to our grandmaster, uh, Most Worship Brother Cundiff, for any final remarks. Um, but before I do that, I, I will note our next lecture uh, is, is just a month away. It will be November 29th. That's the last Sunday of the month. Uh, we will be announcing um, that topic in the next week, week and a half. Uh, so keep your eyes open uh, for announcements on the Facebook page regarding uh, who the speaker will be, what the topic will be uh, as, as we move forward. But November 29th, uh, 7 p.m., uh, registration routes will be the same as we used this time. So thank you for joining us. Uh, most forceful, sir, the floor is yours. Right, Worshipful, thank you very much for an informative and interesting talk. Uh, it was obviously well attended and people appreciated it. Thank your committee on our behalf, and we look forward to seeing or hearing the next talk at the end of November. And uh, wish all of the members and brothers well, all of the people who have attended from around the country. It's good to see you. It's good to hear from you. Uh, God bless you all, and we hope to see you and hear from you again at the end of November. Thank you, Right Worshipful. That would be all. Thank you, sir. Good night, brethren. Good night. Brother Wayne, are you still on? You're still on here, aren't you? Hey, hey, hey. I, what, I gonna, what I was going to tell you is I was able to pull up my reference on that. And, and here's what it says, just so you can hear this. Sure. Just it, it interests me what you said. The Charter of Washington Lodge Number 12, Fayetteville, Arkansas, was handed to me by Brother B.F. Little of Pioneer Lodge Number 22, Iowa. I will, unless otherwise ordered, retain it until a safe opportunity return uh, opportunity appears to return it, either to the Grand Lodge of Arkansas or to the Brethren of Fayetteville. It being granted by the Lodge, Grand Lodge of Tennessee in 1837, before the formation of the Grand Lodge, causes it to be cherished by our Fayetteville Brethren as its original charter. Okay, so that sounds like it was the uh, Tennessee Charter. That yeah. They had. yeah. And I'll be curious, uh, a good friend of mine uh, through Boy Scouting is one of their district deputy grandmasters. And so I'll toss something out to him and, and see that because um, I was going to say that. I was wondering what the date was, what year they picked up that charter. Say again? 1863 is the note of that report. 63, okay. That's the note of that report. Okay, because there were about that time, and I'll have to check the date. He went. He went south. Like I guess the 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 Union troops came through and actually had uh, uh, taken over the capital, and so down in in little town of Washington, which was a county seat, which was, it's really close to Texarkana, and okay. uh, they actually had their state legislature meet there for at least one session. And so it could have been, and what frequently would happen is, is forces would go through a town and uh, maybe somebody would ransack or somebody who was a Mason to protect from being ransacked would secure their charters or maybe their, the jewels. Uh, we had a, uh, a South Alabama lodge in about 1870. Uh, it was discovered and they returned it. Uh, that somebody had taken it and, a, and a, a Mason realized it, he safeguarded it. And of course it took a while after the war to work its way back down because, uh, you know, communication wasn't quite like it, it is today. Well, and, and that's, what's interesting, you know, uh, and, and I find our situation in terms of records kind of a head scratcher. Um, I had, I had a brother who was a, a pretty prolific studier of, of the grand secretary at the time, right? Worship with O'Sullivan. And, and, he was always trying to figure out why O'Sullivan spent so much time in Springfield um, because that's where he was based. It, the Grand Lodge wasn't based there, uh, but he spent at least three years down there. Um, and if you look in 1862, he basically, he almost kind of insults everybody down there because he says that, you know, 
and this is his actual report, it's been well known to the underside signed for many years that too many lodges within the past 10 years have been organized in the southwest part of the state. These ought never to have existed. The reasons for my opinions are unsuitableness of the place, ignorance of those selected to be officers, and the lack of utter accommodation for safe carrying on of the work. I have endeavored to get possession of these charters. So he basically went down there on a mission to shut stuff down. Uh, and then, of course, the war got much more aggressive around him. Uh, and so he actually, the next couple of years, all he does is report, you know, no returns for these people. And this got burned and this one didn't get burned. And I've got piles of this and piles of that here and there. Uh, and then he returns to St. Louis in 64. Um, but that, that map earlier, just to you, you look at it, and then you look about the campaigns and, and where troops were active. And it makes sense. I mean, it makes perfect sense. Um, the one that cracked me up on that was that KC-220 uh, was robbed, because I feel like that's in a much more populous place. And the fact that their lodge room got robbed is, is a little bit surprising to me. Um, but uh, that's just kind of the break of it. So, brethren, uh, again, thank you all for your time. Have a good evening uh, and, and good night. Great night. Nice job.